After an amazing time in Kikaka, we headed back to the mainland for the reason that brought us to Belize, Belkin. From the marina, we picked up a van and drove to the airport, where the Belican Brewery is strategically located near Ladyville. I've been curious about Belican ever since my first trip to Belize several years ago. Its reputation as the beer of Belize is more than just a marketing slogan. It's everywhere you look, it's everywhere you eat, and it's served at every bar. It's what people drink. You can't find Budweiser or Coors in Belize, which I'm not complaining about, but I found it a little odd that here in a tropical paradise, one brewery has monopolized the entire country's market. Ask around, and locals will tell you that Belican has dominated with iron-fisted business tactics and will do whatever it has to to eliminate the competition. Driving up, all I could think about was that it looked like some kind of fortress. Let's take a look at the history of this company and the people who built it. Eric Bowen, a sixth-generation Belizean, started a lemonade company in 1932. He slowly grew the company into a large corporation that eventually called itself Crystal Bottling. In 1968, his son Barry Bowen was brought into the business, and Bowen & Bowen Limited was created. Besides lemonade, Bowen & Bowen sold soft drinks and bottled water. Bottled water is a hot commodity in a country where public water is often risky. Soon after, they became the sole manufacturer and distributor of Coca-Cola products in Belize. Later, the company's monopoly was extended to all cola products when Coke's rival, Pepsi, found itself unable to compete. Father and son entered the beer business in 1969, founding the Belize Brewing Company, the Brewer of Belican. The first bottle went on sale in 1971. Soon, another competitor showed itself on the market. Charger was founded by Arturo and Orlando Matus, industrious brothers whose grandparents had immigrated from the Yucatan during the caste wars. If you ask any Belizean, they will tell you the old tale of how Belican broke all their bottles and that put Charger out of business. Turns out that wasn't the full story, and not in the slightest. I decided that the best thing to do would be to find these guys and ask them about it personally. I met Arturo's son, Daniel, at his smoothie shop in BTL Park in Belize City. After I explained my intentions, he contacted his father for an interview. While Orlando studied business administration at Loyola University in New Orleans, his brother Arturo worked at a hotel in Guatemala where he heard stories from guests about possible business adventures. And one of them told me the story of the Guatemalan family that owned the brewery in Guatemala. And it got me very interested to see how this family started a brewery in Guatemala and became very successful on the long run. Orlando liked the idea too. After finishing his degree at Loyola, Orlando and his new wife joined Arturo in Belize City and began raising money to build a brewery. We, we, we had a small business then, and we start working up that business to try and increase our capital to go into this venture. The name of that venture was Charger Beer. The, the, the name was, was decided on by my brother and his wife because as you can see on the logo it had a horse with a, a knight and a spare and he was charging and we the idea was then that we probably would have to charge on the competitor <laughs> which we did and was very successful the matus brothers continued moving forward as if they didn't know the meaning of the word impossible. They found countless ways to repurpose or rebuild equipment that would suit their needs at a fraction of the normal cost. And then from there on, we start working towards getting the machinery. My brother was able to get a boiler from New Orleans, uh, from a train that was scrapped, a huge boiler. He brought it on to Belize and we rebuilt that boiler for it to work for the purpose. The tanks, I got them from Guatemala. We got 12 tanks, 2,000 gallons each. We brought them to Belize and we rebuilt them. It was rebuilt by sandblasting the inside and outside and getting all the rust completely off. And then after that, it was painted with a sort of epoxy paint that was suitable for the purpose that would create no aftertaste 
in the, in the bear. Now we needed refrigeration, so we, we learned of a ship that sunk out in the harbor, so we had all the refrigeration. From that ship, we had it back into Belize, and we worked on it and had it rebuilt, and we put it to work. So we had the refrigeration going, we had the tanks going, we had the boiler going. We bought a kettle, a stainless steel kettle, to do the cooking of the material. My brother, before we actually went into brewing, he brought down a few consultants in the industry. And when they talked about what he had in mind, they all said that wouldn't work, that wouldn't work, that wouldn't work. So they were all negative to his ideas. But he told me the idea that I have, they don't agree with, but I know it's going to work. And it did work indeed. Finally, the government approved Chargers brewing and bottling permits, and the Matus brothers were struggling to keep up with the demand. We used to bottle about 1,500 cases of beer per day when everything was going smooth. When we started bottling, people were around waiting to, to buy the beer, and it was not even bottled. And, and, and the first batch of beer was sold even before it came into the bottle. Then they, we used to put it in crates, and there was no time to put a label, as the customers couldn't wait. We had the labeling machine, but they didn't have no time to wait for that, so they took the beer like that. In the beginning, had a success story that everybody accepted the beer. It was a very popular beer countrywide. Everywhere you go, to the Keys, to San Pedro, PG from north to south, east and west, you know. So I, I don't, can't recall the years, but um, in the 70s, when, when Charger Beer came out, they had 90% of the market. But because the demand was there, it began doubling up. Working 24 hours a day, it began doubling up. During the mid-70s, when Charger Beer was far more popular than Bellican, the Matus brothers were putting money back into the community. We had a one-hour program on the radio, on the Love FM, on Radio Belize. I think it was a one-hour, I think it was once a week or twice a week. I don't remember. We had programs on the radio, just this feel it charger. We had a basketball team, a football team, a baseball team, softball. We always contributed. Well, we contributed a few scholarships to kids that needed to further their education at maybe a high school level. We help. We help people that needed some medical attention. My brother helped. He was very good at that. He was a real Christian, I'm telling you. As Charger became more and more successful, Bellican was going downhill fast. The, their banker then was the Bank of Nova Scotia in Belize. And the manager then came to me, to my office, with a bunch of keys, and he said, Arturo, I come to give you the competitor's brewery. They have closed their doors, and we can talk thereafter as to payments on a long-term basis. You'll pay us, but you can start brewing. I went to my brother with the keys, and I said, brother, he said, Mr. So-and-so has the right to live, too. I do not believe in monopoly. I do not believe in monopoly. Go back to the bank and give them back the keys. We won't, we won't have only one brewery. We need, a, we need a competition. We need two breweries. That was his idea. As Charger became more and more successful, Bellican sided with Cerveceria Andorena and the government. Details of these partnerships aren't widely known, but the results are obvious. They, they had a concession. They paid no taxes on all the materials that they imported. No taxes. 
Det blir low income tax. Det var så lot of tax. They were saving. We had to pay all our taxes. They the Belkid equipment started deteriorating and they got a loan from the Bank of Nova Scotia and a stand for a million dollars and they have renovated their equipments and built up and got new bottles, ceramic labels and it, it, it was probably the same people with that owns millions of dollars that decided that they would come back to Belize with a new strategy of bringing in um, equipment to, to, to distribute draft beer and they went around to all corners of the country to give it to them free of charge on the conditions that they would freeze the sale of charge of beer and they did it and they kept telling the customer oh we have it but it's not cool but we have belly in that is ice cool this is what happened this is a fact the situation turned even more sour when ideas of sabotage arose. One Sunday, my dad went to check out what was going on at the installations, and he found the one compressor was not working. And when my dad opened the, to check the, the lube that's in the base of the compressor, he found sand in it. And that's what messed up that compressor. After setting a new market environment, it didn't take long for Bellican to turn the tides of beer sales in Belize. It was a sudden takeover, like, you know? It was a sudden takeover. It happened so, maybe over a period of a month, you know, everything just, one went down and one went up. When my brothers got the notion, got the, began to realize what was going on, he decided that he would get back to them by getting the government to legislate an antitrust law. So he went back to school in New Orleans to get a thesis on the antitrust law, and he drafted out a thesis, and he gave it then to the then Prime Minister of Belize, which was Manuel Esquivel because the guy who was prime minister, who had gone to school with him, who was his friend, who was his chess partner, every Saturday they played chess, denied him of a law that was good for the country. He left and he went. He took his family, he left everything. And he abandoned the brewery. He was so mad. He abandoned the brewery. Orlando left Belize, never to return. Soon after, the Bank of Nova Scotia foreclosed on the loan to Charger, and within a short amount of time had demolished the building and sold all the equipment for scrap. With Charger now defunct, Bellican became a powerful monopoly, and Barry Bowen was on his way to becoming one of the wealthiest and most powerful men in Belize. Bowen's wealth and influence grew after the Prime Minister appointed him to the Senate in 1998. He was a huge contributor to the People's United Party, which wrote legislation on business and finance, passing laws that were highly favorable to Bellican. Import taxes soon made larger, more well-known imports too expensive for the average Belizean. Bowen and Bowen then got the rights for two of those major beers. For a long time, the Red Stripe distribution license was held by Bowen and Bowen. In this case, it said that instead of competing with a rival, the company simply withheld it from the marketplace. Also, Bellican obtained the sole rights to brew Guinness at the brewery therefore taking out that competition from the market. The Bowen family is deeply invested in numerous industries, including agriculture, shrimp farms, coffee plantations, auto dealerships, private nature reserves, and resorts. Between all these holdings, the Bowen family, at one time, owned over a million acres. That's almost a fifth of Belize. That would be like one American family owning all of Alaska. Okay, so here's the question. Are monopolies bad? Well, not necessarily, but it depends on the company and its corporate ethics. If a company, like a local utility company, is the sole provider of electric power, as long as they are looking out for their customers and providing cost-effective power, then there's no problem. But if that company raises its rates unfairly or keeps innovative new power suppliers from the marketplace, then it's a bad deal for everyone else. This brings us to the topic of corporate ethics. In the past, corporate ethics meant looking out for the end user and giving them the best product. 
In the later half of the 20th century, the definition shifted to mean that corporations are mainly only looking to make money for their shareholders. In the beer world, what does this mean? Let's take a look at AB InBev, the company that produces Budweiser, Bex, Michelob, and hundreds of other brands around the world. They are a big, faceless, multinational corporation known for buying other companies and reducing the ingredients of the original recipes to make more money per beer sold. This is in direct contrast to how a lot of these brewers started, where they focused primarily on the taste and the quality of the product that was being created. In the US, Budweiser may or may not still reign as the king of beers, but in Belize, the Belize Brewing Company, the producer of Bellican, wears the crown of royalty. In 2007, Barry Bowen, at the age of 62, was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. The beer tycoon's new title? Sir Barry Bowen, Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. For 40 years, Bellican completely dominated the beer scene in Belize. In the past few years, however, the landscape has changed, posing new challenges for the company. In 2005, the government passed revenue measures that included a tax hike on beer. Bowen resigned his Senate seat in protest. Then in 2008, an open trade agreement with CARICOM, essentially the EU of the Caribbean, obligated each Caribbean nation to open its markets to imports from other members. Now, even the biggest companies in Belize are barred from using their leverage to keep other products out of the market. For the first time since the 1970s, Belizeans could finally buy beers like Heineken, Red Stripe, and Kabuli at prices that were competitive with Bellican. The other recent development, and definitely the most dramatic, was that Sir Barry Bowen died in a plane crash. On a windy day in 2010, on the way to San Pedro, Sir Barry was piloting his Cessna 206 with four other passengers on board when the plane went down, killing everyone on board. Sir Barry left the company to his children. Instead of selling the company, they decided to make it their own and give it a reboot. Enter the new face of the company, Shelley Bowen Stonecipher, Sir Barry's daughter. While her brother, Michael Bowen, moved up to manager of Bowen & Bowen, she took on the task of marketing. Although Belizean-born, she was schooled in the States. Soon after moving back to Belize to help her brother run the business, Shelley headed a marketing campaign to help the company reach out to Belizeans and earn their continued loyalty to the brand, while also reminding Belizeans that Bellican wants to keep on being part of their daily lives in work, play, sports, and everything else. We just created a year-long advertising campaign we attempt to capture a little bit of every slice of life in Belize. It was about traveling to every section, every district, many villages of Belize and capturing what people are doing and how they're doing it when they're drinking beer. want someone to look at something that we're doing with Bellican and smile and say, yeah, that's Belize. Just, yeah, that's my country. When we did put the first 90 second commercial on television, we got so much feedback from expats or people who have had lived here or people who have moved out of Belize saying it made them homesick and we knew we'd done the right thing. It went viral. We probably had, what, 200,000 hits within the first two months, which was unheard of for a country of a population of 300,000. That means everybody. Another important move by the company was hiring Nolan Michael. Nolan is the first Belizean brewmaster in Bellican's 40-year history. 
My brother, when he took over, decided that we needed a, a Belgian brewmaster. It made all the sense in the world, and we had somebody on board who was going to be perfect, and it was Nolan. Uh, previously, we've only ever had uh, German brewmasters. I have become the first brewmaster, um, Belizean born uh, brewmaster for uh, Belize Brewing Company. He went and got all the certifications needed, which was easy for him because he's like this geeky engineer who knows everything and chemist. I have a master's degree in uh, organic synthesis chemistry and analytical chemistry. Um, those were pretty much prerequisites for attending uh, the World Brewing Academy. Without a doubt, it's an honor and a privilege. Belican also wants Belizeans to think of them not only as the biggest company in Belize, but as a good corporate citizen. As the beer of Belize, one of the things we believe very strongly is giving back and having a social responsibility to the country. We, we support a cross-country cycling team out of Cayo called Western Spirits. They're a young team, and so we support them. We support a lot of the races, like La Ruta Maya. We're supporting three young teams in that. And uh, so we try and be everywhere, just doing a little bit and as much as we can. Uh, the spent grain coming out of our facilities from our mouth, we actually use as feed to local uh, farmers. It's being used to feed cattle, uh, pigs, uh, uh, many different types of livestock. Of course, uh, any brewer tries to maximize their, uh, their extract yield from their malt, but there's still some protein and some uh, carbohydrates left in that uh, spent grain, and it's excellent for cattle feed. Bellican's also at every party. We donate beer for door prizes. We pay for a lot of musicians. And every year we have something called the Bellican Bash. It's a three-day concert. It's completely free, and we try and hire all the latest or favorite Belizean music artists. The three-day concert has typically been in Belize City, and we have favorites like Loverboy and Super G, which are Dagriga artists. So we really believe in supporting local musicians. I wanted to ask about the Bellican controversies, about Sir Barry playing rough with his rivals. Not surprisingly, Bellican people have a different take on it. Well, as with any other business operating here in Belize, the, your relationship with the government is the government provides an enabling environment. You produce a good in that uh, enabling environment and you pay taxes. And that's what it uh, basically is. Uh, a lot of people always uh, tend to think that uh, Belize Brewing Company has some sort of special exemptions. Uh, and the real truth of the matter is there is none. We started out with a development con concession way back when the company was first started. Those exemptions have long since expired. In fact, we pay, <laughs> I think we pay the largest amount of taxes in the whole, or more than any other company in the entire country. Other than the government of Belize, we're the largest employer in the entire country. Everything that we have always done is, has been about enhancing our brand, enhancing jobs in the country of Belize. and. Uh, that's what we continue to do every day. It translates to building your brand. Um, I want to be a part of something that um, I can look back at someday and say, um, it started out here, but we grew to something that all, not just us here at Belize Brewing Company can be proud of, but all Belizeans can be proud of. It's, there's always more. I want I would like to see Belizeans locally and Belizeans internationally all around the world be able to say, that's our beer, that's our brand, and we love it. A new generation of Bowens are in charge, and Bellican is bigger than ever. Some of the changes they have made are definitely good things. Nolan Michael, the company's first Belizean brewmaster, is producing interesting, tasty new craft brews, including their seasonals that cater to the taste profiles of beer lovers in this tropical climate. Lately, more imported beers are becoming available in Belize too. Choice is always good. Competition is good, because it encourages innovation and hopefully better quality at lower prices. So how would Bellican react if another craft brewer appeared in Belize to compete with them? The Belize Brewing Company has had the luxury of being one of the only breweries in Belize for decades. If another brewery were to arrive or people were to set up nano breweries, craft breweries of some nature, I think we'd welcome it if the beer were good. We'd certainly have to reserve judgment and decide whether or not the beer was worth drinking, but you know. Since the death of Sir Barry Bowen, Bellican has worked overtime to rebrand themselves as a craft brewer. 
I guess this really brings up the question about what a craft brewer is. If you were to say that it's all about a company listening to the local audience and producing artisanal products especially for them, then yeah, Bellican is craft, and they're doing the right thing. I must say that I really like their Mayan chocolate stout. With that roasty stout flavor up front, with the smooth cacao finish, I could drink that all day. It's been an honor for, to have you guys here. I hope that comes through. I hope that you saw it in our staff. Everybody here enjoys what they do and they feel a sense of pride coming to work here every day. Really Thank appreciate you. Your My time. pleasure. As we left Bellican, they generously gave us six crates of beer, which we used as currency to open doors and smooth our negotiations. The beer of Belize was as good as gold. Belican, give us a job promoting you worldwide, international. Boom! Best beer in the world. Belican to the world. Later in the Beer Diaries World Tour, we'll be visiting Island Time Brewery, the first new entry in the Belizean beer market in more than 40 years. On the next Beer Diaries World Tour, we'll be going on the road with an amazingly talented musician, an international ambassador for the Garanagoo people, Aurelio Martinez.